if I can do that. So why don't I get started and then we can give some time to Jen at the end to make any announcements she wanted to make to the to the group. Let me get going here. Okay. I think I can share my screen. Yep, I can do that. And we'll go over to the slides. See the slides just fine, Gabe? Yeah, this works great. Okay. Um, thanks to Jen and Marty for putting together the series and inviting me to join it as part of it. Um, we are one of sort of the, the working groups that can't wait to start working at NC in Santa Barbara. <clears throat> We uh, put together our proposal a little over two years ago, and we our funding, our announcement of the funding happened just at the start of the pandemic. So we've been working remotely the last uh, year and a half and made some progress and look forward to working together as a group. Um, this project started out through conversations with Lee Stanish when she was at NEON and sort of cascaded through some of the interesting work being done with, at in Janet Jansen's group at PNNL and George Rodriguez. And we brought in a archival li liaison, Margaret O'Brien, who's just been very helpful and had many nice insights into the proposal and moving forward. And Jason McDermott, who's a computational scientist at, at PNNL. <clears throat> There's many more people, um, some of whom I know and some of whom I still have only met online. We're one of the largest working groups. We have nearly 20 people. And here's a link to our, our GitHub website that we started and getting established. Um, so I'm really looking forward to working more closely with these people. We've had some online meetings and it's a really great group of researchers who are working, many who are working at LTR sites, but also CZO and do um, sort of broader soil microbiology work in, in other settings. <clears throat> and I wanna give a special thanks to to Marty for encouraging us to put together a synthesis proposal. When I first started talking with Lee Stanish about ideas, I think we we're still very sort of pie in the sky. And we didn't even know that these working group ex existed. And then just that week, uh, the call came out. <clears throat> and for um, Marty for encouraging me to go to the uh, 2019 International LTR meeting in, in Germany, which really helped me develop the ideas further for the synthesis proposal. And for NCS, I cannot wait to be there and working with you all. I got to go there in February of 2020 um, for a reproducible research research. And even though I teach courses using R, I've been working with R for a long time, this research got me thinking about the whole data science ecosystem. And I really encourage other scientists out there, if they have the opportunity or they have that students have the opportunity to participate in these um, workshops, even if you feel like, like you know our or know parts of it. So putting it all together and thinking about this as a big reproducible research ecosystem is just so wonderful to be part of. Um, a lot of the genesis of this, our synthesis group comes from work that I've done at the prospect at uh, Harvard Forest Experimental Warming Plots. These plots were started by Jerry Malilo and Sutherita Fry. Um, the oldest of which Jerry started about 30 years ago. And Neon came in, oh, about, I guess about 10 years ago now, and I think first established this Neon observation deck about probably eight years ago that overlooks the Swan and Prospect Hill experimental warming plots. And so some of the data that I have is from there and then from other experimental warming plots um, about five miles to the south at Barry Woods. And so I'm not going to really talk about any of the experimental warming data, except to say that it motivated my synthesis working group. We can look at metatranscriptomics data. We can see key changes in many biogeochemical cycles, looking at the, the genes that the organisms in the soil are expressing. But um, what I wanted to, what I was putting together another experimental campaign to do metatranscromics data uh, analyses at Barry Woods. And as part of it, I wanted to be bringing in NEON data. So NEON, this is sort of a view from that same tower looking in a different direction at a different time of year. Um, 
And so the neon plots are, are very close to the Prospect Hill experimental warming plots. Neon does a lot of ecosystem level measurements. So there's a, a good uh, ability to bring in other neon metadata. And neon um, does bacterial 16S analysis and metagenomic sampling analysis and every year. And so I was thinking that you know, it would really be great to put together Harvard Forest experimental warming data with the neon metagenomic data and just have a way that this could get updated because new neon data is going to be coming in from neon every year. And so it seemed like a shame that there was no easy way of doing this. Um, and also in the field of metagenomics currently, and a lot of the analyses are just sort of one-off experiments. And though the data goes to our national archive, it's not very easy to reuse and integrate into other data sets. So Lee and I, Lee who was at NEON at the time, and I started talking about ways of doing that and moving forward. And kind of the way I look at the reusability of soil metagenomic data is like, thinking of the genome as books, but we're taking these different pieces and putting them in different places, even at GenBank or in different databases. And it's hard if you wanna sort of put the genomes back, pieces of DNA back into books, you've gotta to go to many different places and use different tools to rediscover the book that you've sort of torn apart and put in these different places. I have another version of the slide that is a dumpster fire related <laughs> to a computer, but, that's a little more dramatic, but if sometimes it feels like that, that we're throwing away our data after each round of analyses and experimentation. And I just wanna give, um, particularly for the people who are more broader ecologists, sort of an overview, conceptual overview of the process. So in the soil, there are just many diverse, wonderful organisms. There's literally thousands of different species in a teaspoon of soil. And it's hard to fathom that diversity. You know, you're sitting out in the forest, you're looking at the trees, you might be looking at the understory, some cool mushrooms coming up, and you can see hundreds of species easily, but to think of in that small space, there being thousands of different species. You have viruses, you have bacteria, archaea, you have my favorite, the tardigrades, which even though I'm a microbiologist, I, have a thing for tardigrade uh, tweets. Um, and what we do in our analysis is we take soil and we extract the DNA um, from the genomes of those uh, microorganisms in the soil. And we study it in that context and use that to as our window into the organisms that are present and what they're doing. Um, but to do this, we have to break the DNA, the genomes into pieces and sequence these short pieces, somewhere between 100 to 200 base pairs for sort of the high throughput Illumina sequencing. And there's ways to get longer reads, like we've achieved reads working with New England Bio Labs using the PAC biotechnology that are close to 10 KB per um, read, but still we get uh, less data. And then we take these reads and we put them together into larger, what are called contiguous regions that they represent. And then we take these larger pieces of DNA and we try to put them in back into the genomes that they originally came from. And this is called metagenomic binning. And these genomes we call MAGs or metagenome assembled genomes from the environment, and then use these MAGs to gain insights into the organisms that we're studying. For the most part, in sort of the history of doing metagenomics in the soil, the diversity of the soil is so astounding that it's very difficult to actually put the genomes back together into these mags. And so the typical process only results in a handful of mags and therefore we end up really analyzing the short reads and contigs um, in our results. And that figure that I showed you of the metatranscriptomics data highlighting the different biochemical pathways was simply from the analysis of the short reads and not putting together the um, pieces back into genomes, back into the, the book that we wanna be studying. 
And for me, there's this beauty in putting things back in the genome and putting things back together in the genome. You know, it comes from sort of my training more in sort of genomics and evolution. But when I see a genome, I just feel like I have this window into the organism. It's still nice to, to culture and visualize the organism, but it's still, I mean, culture and uh, visualize using microscopy the, the organism and study it that way. But the fact that we can go into the environment and put together these sort of pictures of these beautiful organisms based on their genomes is something that just really drives me. And one of the things that we did just shortly before I started this conversation was with Lee is doing this environmental metagenome analysis, a method that basically ran the soil microbes, or suspended soil in a, in a buffer and filtered down to what we thought were just the bacteria and then separated out those cells and put together them in a sort of more smaller metagenome with a lot less diversity. And in this, we discovered really cool new bacteria and these giant viruses. And so at Harvard Forest, in our LTR experimental warming site, we discovered what is still the world's second largest virus genome, the Hyperion virus, um, as an environmental metagenome assembled genome. So this, these, these new methods that are coming down the pipeline and this discovery really motivated me to start thinking about putting together reference genomes and using them as part of ecological analyses. And one of the ways, important ways that it's used is to take shotgun metagenome reads like such those that are produced every year um, as part of the NEON um, campaigns and being able to map them back to the reference genomes and to use those reference genomes as part of the analysis to enumerate and provide a broader picture of those. So that's really the goal of where we wanted to go in the fields and for this project is really to be working, combining sort of the NEON and LTR data to do this. And so that was kind of the overall development of the framework that's the heart of, the, of our synthesis working group, where in this figure in the top um, right corner, we have LTR metagenomic reads, we have other neon metagenomic reads and reads from um, other um, ecological research stations and sites. And what we do is assemble them, bin them and annotate and relate them to their ecological traits. So in some ways, fairly simple comment uh, concept like with the cartoon that I just showed. And then there's other ones. There's uh, um, different technologies that can be used like that we use to discover the giant viruses at Harvard Forest using fluorescence activated self-sorted genomes. There's a lot of other single cell genomic techniques that can contribute. And then there's actually going and isolating bacteria and viruses is assembling genomes. That's very important work that needs to be done, even though it's uh, difficult and, and very slow. And so one of our sort of goals, somewhat naive, somewhat going forward, was to produce a set of reference genomes integrating these data sets that we could test cross-site and site-specific hypotheses. And so we have a number of motivating hypotheses. There's also um, a need to make these results and think about how this data can be used by non-microbial um, ecologists in conjunction with other ecological metadata. So there's a component of working with the environmental database initiative to make the, more, the uh, data more broadly available. <clears throat> One of the members of the our working group, Emily Ilo Fedrosh, um, had uh, some work ongoing when I when I contacted her, and it was published sort of shortly after the working group got going doing this. And it's also similar with Janet Jansen at um, PNNL, been working with Neon and assembling metagenomes from Neon data. So there was some strategy in thinking that we could pull this off, even though it's a bigger effort. 
um, than a typical, and requires a lot more computational power than we typically think of using in a synthesis group. And so here's an overview of their paper um, from 2020 in Nature Biotechnology, in which our Harvard Forest data sets um, contributed to, and many other, there's other data sets from our working group that are also present in this. So from this, they assembled these metagenome assembled genomes from environments all over the world. And I'm going to focus on sort of an analyzing and pulling more sort of um, insights out of the soil specific part of it. As you can see, there are over 2,000 soil mags um, that were reported as part of this. And so if we look at the, phyl the phylum level designation for the soil mags, and these are all uh, bacterial mags in here, we can see that they're from a variety of specific ecosystems, including agricultural, um, desert, forest, soil, the hybrid forest ones are in that category, grasslands. But you also have other uh, categories like oil contaminated, permafrost is included under this, tropical rainforest, and then just unclassified. It's a little bit hard to, well, actually it's not. The, the pink that you see, the magenta, is really all unclassified sequences. And I'll talk about that more in a bit. But there are kind of the typical things that we'd expect to see in soil, uh, from soil bacteria, including a lot of proteobacteria, um, a lot of tinobacteria, a lot of cytobacteria um, groups in these data sets. But I just want you to sort of, Hold uh, the image of there being a lot of magenta in here from this unclassified, and I'll come back to that. If we look at the distribution of these mags or genomes in soil metagenomes, if you look to the left of this graph, you can see that a lot of the metagenomes, most of the metagenomes, there were zero mags that were assembled from those metagenomes. That is not good for what I want to do and for the working group. And you see this distribution and you see going up towards over 40 genome bins per metagenome, this line of, of magenta that is mostly the unclassified uh, metagenomes. So many of the things that we think of as soil and these soil specific ecosystems, we're getting very poor um, assembly of mags at this. And, We've had some of our remote re, uh, working groups have dealt with this um, question and we're doing sort of new analyses with newer tools that we hope to improve this, but we also think that there's a, a general, there's a few general issues that we need to tackle that we're um, working on. And if you look at it, just the numbers from a table perspective, the unclassified mags dwarf all those other mags. So if we think of like the forest soil mags, we have, we have over 50 metagenomes from Harvard forests that are part of this, but we only have about 30 or 40 mags that are contributed to this. So for a lot of sequencing, we're getting very few genome bins coming out of this. And if you look at uh, the unclassified genome, sorry for a busy table, but if you just focus on the habitat in the bottom right, you can see that a lot of these don't even have any metadata associated with the metagenomic sample. So we're missing some key data that we'd wanna use in, in a broader analysis. And these are just, you know, we're not talking about sort of other uh, things like soil pH or some bio chemical level or basic parts of it. We're talking about just annotation of what ecosystem these metagenomes are from. But we can see some of them like are from a contaminated culture or compost. In fact, nearly all of these unclassified genomes are from things that we wouldn't tip, as ecologists think of as sort of typical soil ecology communities. They're all enriched and manipulated in some way that results in a very few number of bacteria and most of the bacteria are not the common ones that we find in the soil. So even though there's over 2,000 soil genome mags that were um, published as part of this project, 14 of them, about three quarters of them are from these sort of otter um, unclassified environments. And that leaves a very small portion of soil related genomes. 
So this is a, a little bit busy, complex side that I'll take a little bit and walk it through. And so on the left, we have a measure of the nucleotide diversity in the sample um, using KMER frequencies. And so the higher this number here, the more diverse the sample is. And on the uh, X scale um, is the, I just <laughs> had my, my Zoom share screen thing pop up here, um, is a measure of how many um, of the fraction of reads from a particular metagenome that mapped back to a reference, a reference data set. So if you look, most of the um, native soil, so a lot of the unclassified ones map pretty back, well back to their reference genomes and the broader suite of genomes in NCBI. And that's because there are a lot of sort of the, the fast growing weedy bacteria that people typically culture um, and end up enriched in these type of communities. But if you look sort of at the green dots representing the foil forest and some of the desert, most of those do not map back to it. And so this whole idea of taking um, metagenomes, producing mags, and then mapping the DNA back to it, so far in the current state of the art, um, less than 3% of the DNA map to back to it. So this suggests sort of that we still got a ways to go in our concept of creating reference genomes, reference um, sets of genomes to use in analysis pipelines. However, the, the sort of positive spin on it is that for most of the native soil genomes, again, less than 3% of the DNA is mapped to the databases, but this means many microbes remain to be discovered. So just a small fraction of the diversity, the organisms that are present in the soil, do we have any idea what their, their genomes look like? And so there's a lot of diversity that we need to work with and pull out. And again, this, uh, this is part of one of the things that motivated me to keep pushing on both the computational and developing uh, new experimental methods for putting together um, soil metagenomes. And that's a big push of the working group uh, going forward. I, there, there's a lot of things about um, when I started working um, with Jerry Malilo 10 years ago at the Harvard Forest Sites and went from being a, a laboratory, largely a laboratory sort of single organism culture perspective to working in the soil. So one is you, I gradually every year, I appreciate more and more the spectacular diversity in the soil. Um, but that also makes it very complicated to analyze and work with. The other um, sort of, I have a sort of deep-rooted human microbiome project, Envy. Um, and part, the, the human gut microbiome is, is very simple relative to the soil microbiome. It's not saying that it's simple overall, but uh, in a relative perspective. And just in sort of the early first decade of the human microbiome project, there was $170 million devoted to it. And that's not including you know, other satellite projects that built upon and use that. And that's just the US project. And there's other global project, microbiome projects as well. So for many of us in the LTR network, we probably have a good idea of the amount each LTR site gets over their five-year grant. And um, they don't add up to $170 million. The other thing that's just, um, I think it's beautiful, a lot of the work that's being done um, on the Human Microbiome Project, and, and it's just sort of the ways that we can see what's happening, the interactions among the microbes there are amazing. But there are now over 1,500 reference genomes from cultivated bacteria, and actually that's a slightly older number. And using these environmental metagenome approaches, there's now a sort of unified catalog with over 200,000 reference genomes from the human gut microbiome. And so this is, you know, one species, Homo sapiens, in one body location 
in that species, there's 200,000 reference genomes. And so if we look at forest soil over all the different forest soil metagenomes that have been done all around the world, in the US, there's 182. So this again highlights the need to put a lot more resources into cultivating bacteria to creating new approaches and new methods for putting together reference genomes from the soil. Um, and DOE has a new uh, project that will probably be announced related to, to soil microbiomes and ecosystems coming up, but there's really a lot more focused energy that needs to be put into this to really understand the broader diversity and put together um, data sets for more easily using data sets like NEONs and other ones. So each, the, the more you put into these reference projects, the less you need to spend on each individual project because you can map and use a number of tools developed as part of the human microbiome project to better analyze your ecological data. So one of the things that we did early on um, that we could do remotely is apply for more grants. So working with Janet Jansen, this opportunity came up through DOE to put together a, a multi-agency, um, really basically it's, it's almost like submitting a same grant proposal to three different groups. And it's all under the umbrella of the Department of Energy FICUS, Facilities Integrating Collaborations for Science Program. So what this specific call was, was to work with NEON soil data um, that's been collected and archived in, in Arizona as part of the NEON um, campaigns, and to use the facilities at the Joint Genome Institute, which are um, largely are the ones that we chose to use as part of this, the DNA and RNA sequencing facilities, and then the mass spectroscopy facilities at, at EMSL um, in Washington State. And so this is a grant put together by the leadership team of our emergent group, along with Stuart Grandy and Will Weeder at, at NCAR. And so what we want to do is we want to sort of build on what we're doing now in terms of putting together soil reference genomes and approaches, but bring it together, oops, the next slide, integrating <clears> through <throat> new approaches for putting together these reference genomes using fact sorted mini metagenomes, but also work on soil ma organic matter analysis using the FTICR MS technology at <clears throat> MSOL, which you can uh, identify, not identify, you can, uh, you get 10,000 different soil peaks, but actually a good number of them, several thousand, you can identify to some level what those, those peaks might be and look at cellular metabolites and lipids and bring this all together and test hypothesis related to temperature and soil uh, gradients across neon sites. So this is a really cool opportunity. We were uh, very fortunate to get this funding and it's really having this working group established that we could respond to and put together a high quality proposal. And again, like our working group, it turns out this is one of the larger proposals that was funded um, as part of the FICUS program. Some of the things we did with it and sort of gave us some insight into how we needed to sort of perceive as a community to put these together. I've actually given two talks, two, three talks now for EMSL and JGI of how to put together these type of proposals. And it wasn't, it wasn't easy. We have a really excellent group that I was working with and in part um, working with Neon and Lisa Stanish was at the neon time, we could, um, Lee wrote our code that helped us pull out a lot of the metadata um, associated with the soil samples at um, neon. And we focused in part because of our, our interests on forest soil samples. We were able to put together a set of data that spanned soil temperature, gradients as well as soil moisture gradients and pulled this down from the NEON um, data set. And I think our ability to do this is what gave us really a good uh, run at putting together a high quality proposal. And 
two students in my lab have taken this sort of approach, this R script, and made R shiny applications to help our user group go through and look at the neon soil metadata and easily subselect parts of that data and look at uh, graphs. Oops, sorry, this this one didn't quite come out. Um, of the soil moisture by temperature interactions across certain types, like forested sites are what we used in our, our proposal. So we're looking forward to um, working with EMSL and JGI. And so part of doing a, a, a synthesis group is to put together the existing data. And of course, there's no funding to put together new data, but through getting this grant proposal over the next two years, we'll have some beautiful new data um, coming out of this um, JGI and EMSL that the working group will also be able to use and put into this larger context. Um, so the annotation that we ran into around the metagenomes is a, it's a larger problem in the field. And again, uh, Emily uh, has been working on this as part of the National Microbiome Database Catalog. And so there's a lot of um, push these days. And actually this is, I learned about some of this when I was at NCS as part of the working group to really make data more um, available to research so that it can be better reused and more accessible. And so some of this is really um, working out best practices for curating the data and processing the data and getting people, researchers particularly, to add that important metadata, um, particularly since most of it's fairly easy to add in the tables. Other types of metadata require additional experiments. Um, there's a lot of really nice work going through there. Um, and there's a lot of nice work being done by the EDI to create general workflows for data harmonization. And a lot of our, our work, a lot of actually, uh, a number of um, sort of key sort of pass forward um, for our emergent working group were from uh, Will Weeder and Kate Lajtha's um, soil soda group, soil um, organic data harmonization group. So summary here. So most of the soil reference genomes <laughs> Um, at least in the GEM database, um, the, the MAGs, are not from samples that ecologists like myself would think of as native soil. They're enriched or contaminated in some way. And though they're, the microbes are probably originally from soil, they're the fast growing ones that we see over and over again. And still, um, the the isolated genomes and the reference genomes that are out there, um, we're, we're not able to very well map the metagenomic data against those data sets. And so I think some of the stuff that we've been working on as a group this last year, we're getting those numbers up a lot higher. It's still way lower than uh, where I'd like it to be, you know, just through computational approaches, we can, you know, more approach the 10% level. But I think there's going to be a, a need to be a big targeted effort to sort of um, map out some of this diversity. And this is really important for being able to reuse and more easily use other soil metagenomic data. You know, there's, it, it really is at, at a point sometimes where people just, do experiments and throw away the data because the size of the data makes it difficult. We can still put it in CBI, so we're not really throwing away. But right now, effectively, we're not reusing the data as well as we could for other experiments. <clears throat> Whoops. Um, and so while there exists in a community standard um, minimum information about a metagenome sequence, the ecological metadata terms will still vary inconsistent across the data sets. And the term unclassified was the most abundant term under the specific ecosystem category. And this sort of highlights the extent of challenge for making the data findable for ecosystem studies and for interoperability with other data sets. Um, I'm really hopeful going forward. There's some amazing 
efforts that to me I've in some ways I've just wished for for many years. There's efforts like the genome taxonomy database system, which takes bacterial genomes and archaeal genomes and put them in a relative evolutionary distance framework. So that it's, and then we're starting to more look at the taxonomical, taxonomic levels in the context of genetic distances. So that it's not a hard cutoff for associating a genetic distance with a taxonomic level, but more of an objective one and more of a meaningful one. And there's the emerging seek code initiative which will again provide more consistent nomenclature for bacteria class these newer data sets. It's really difficult, especially for a non-bacterial expert to come into the, the field and understand this data and how it can contribute to biodiversity studies. But one of the important things um, that I think of when we go in and we use these DNA-based methods, really we can get insights into thousands of different microorganisms in a single sample, all within you know, the context of about $100 in sequencing context. So if you think of being able to sort of do biodiversity samples on that many different species um, with a pretty small budget, that's really the future of where we're going. And we really like to be able to make this data available to people outside the microbial community for that will bring their perspectives into biodiversity analysis. And we look forward to working with some of those. <clears throat> so we're really excited to be uh, starting a workshops at NCS over the next couple of years. And if you're interested in contributing in any way, there's st still room um, in the seat at the table, especially now that we've all learned to at least use remote um, conferencing capabilities in some contexts particularly add, interested in adding in graduate students and postdocs that might be willing to be part of it, that were in some ways, which there already are a few part of it, but the numbers we had to limit, you know, more from flying costs going into Santa Barbara, but now we're going to open that up to what will be more manageable, well, what will still be small, but manageable groups going forward. So again, I'd really like to give a big thanks to Marty for helping me move forward, for helping organize this. I'd like to give a special thanks to Dave Myrold, who um, passed away this past year after we got going. David has um, got a number of grants over the last 10 years related to putting metagenomic working groups. My students have benefited from those, um, those grants, a lot of which provide travel funds to different uh, meetings, um, but also many other people in this working group. Thank you. I'm willing to take questions and uh, yeah, I'll stop sharing here. Thank you, Jeff. So I can, um, I'm well, back. I it's good to, to see you, Jen. Yeah, I'm so, really Jen, sorry. if you want to put any more in, I don't, sorry, I don't get to see the participants. Yeah, um, no, but, I'm really sorry for the interrupted introduction. Um, classic, my internet uh, just died and kicked me out. But I'm really glad that you all got started. And I just wanted to tell all our attendees to please um, feel free to ask Jeff questions. You could have done it throughout, but you can definitely do it now through the Q&A tab, which is on the, the bottom um, of your screen somewhere <laughs> in your Zoom window. And we also could can watch for raised hands and we're able to unmute you as an attendee if you raise your hand. Please know though that this, this is being recorded um, and will be placed up on the um, YouTube channel that the um, network office runs. Now you're gonna and scare so people away, Jim. <laughs> I know. It, 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 you know, you just write your message in the Q&A and, and um, you can do it anonymously even if, if you like. So. That was um, incredibly interesting. We're so excited, Jeff, about um, the work you've done to date so far and really getting going once we can all get back in person at NCS. So. Jeff, can I start you off with a question? Sure. So I worked a little bit in uh, using genetic techniques five or six years ago. And I know for some of these high throughput methods, there's a huge variation in you know ways you can process the samples and a huge variation yeah. of results you get out of them. Mm -hmm. Have you guys, I mean, I'm sure that's worse now, five years later. I'm sure there's a million more things. Um, have you guys looked at this issue between sort of different methodological approaches to, to sequencing and like kind of what you get out of it? 
Um, so no and yes. So I'll start out with the no. We intentionally didn't want to do that and sort of wanted to harmonize the data. And so part of the work that was going ongoing at JGI and Emily's lab and Janet's lab at um, PNNL, they were running the NEON data sets and many of the soil metagenomes through as part of larger analyses that were in process at those two sites. And those two sites started interacting as part of this. So we basically ran a lot of metagenomes through the exact same methods and got results. So we got consistency across them via that approach. Um, I didn't present the NEON uh, mag data, but there was only about one or two metagenome bins that came out of each neon metagenome, soil metagenome data set. So again, the, there's a sort of, <laughs> there's consistency in our analysis that was consistently what we wanted. We wanted, we were so hoping for this whole bonanza of neon soil metagenomes to emerge. Some of it was the, the tools that were used at that time um, have continued evolving. And so now there's improved tools that we're reapplying to subsets of the data at first, where we can apply different methods and see how we can pull out more metagenome associated genomes analyses from those. And then that would go maybe into informing um, some broader efforts like the National Microbiome Database Collaborate on ways of updating these data sets. That's the, the good thing is working with the DOE facilities. There's just amazing computational groups there, both scientists and resources that we've been able to access. And the good, again, some of it comes down to collection method. There, so there's all sorts of levels of influencing it. But at least when we get the DNA sequence, we can always be going back and reanalyzing that DNA sequence with newer methods. You know, things that happen before we get the sequence in terms of storing of the organisms, manipulating, you know, that's. That's science, that's ecosystem science. <laughs> right on, thank you, Jeff. There's a question from Diane. I can read it to you if you like. Um, I share your interest in tardigrades. Okay, <laughs> Diane, who, who doesn't share Jeff? Who does not love tardigrades, I admit. Um, so Diane says, I share your interest in tardigrades. Would it be interesting to compare the gut microbiomes of tardigrades across the LTR? We at MCM have active tardigrades that thrive on mats in the dry valleys in Antarctica, for example. I have, so I've <laughs> sort of the, how many things you can do at once problem. I, there's, I, I'm totally fascinated by working with um, some of the soil and vertebrate gut microbiomes and associated microbes. And I would certainly have, get a lot of joy out of doing a tardigrade microbiome project. So I'd be helpful. I would be willing to be part of that. I don't know if I'm the right person to lead it. Um, but there's a lot of, we have also thought of mites the same way. Um, so I think there's cool things that could be done. And again, those are things one of the difficult things about doing a lot of the soil work is you can't see your organisms. Or at least if you start with some of these, there's ways to go through and enrich for and select those and study those particular communities. Okay, Diane, so maybe a, a session at the ASM or we'll see another synthesis proposal around tardigrades. Oh yeah. That would be awesome. Um, <laughs> so there's a second question that came in from um, Guilaine Tabot. Um, Apologies for the pronunciation. Uh, what do you think about culture, uh, culture omics efforts and single cell sequencing approaches to better characterize the microbiota? Yeah. So I'm, I'm even though I, well, my labs cultured a number of novel bacteria. We've described new genre, new species of bacteria in the past. I'm a big believer on culturing microbes on studying them in the lab, better understanding the physiology in the lab. Now that said, there, we're only gonna be able, you're gonna have to be very targeted and hit the important ecological, maybe keystone things to better understand. There's no way that we're gonna go through and culture all the diversity that's there and study that in the laboratory. So I think there's a big need for still going forward with different environmental techniques and also with this, Environmental techniques, you're seeing 
ecology of what's happening there in the environment and what genes are being expressed and what the organisms are interacting with. So with cell, um, and so I think doing single cell genomics is a good way to do it. Um, one of the challenges right now is you still get a lot of partial genomes and you get, um, you'll get wells with no genome amplification. So one of the things that we did working with Tanya Wilkes lab at JGI is use sort of a hybrid approach where we used the single cell genomic method on pools of 100 cells. And so by doing this, we could be more cost effective in terms of the process. And the diversity was low enough that we could still disentangle the sequences back into genomes. And so we're very successful. We have a couple of papers out, and that's where we discovered the giant viruses was using that method. So I think some of these hybrid methods that we can have slightly, that still reduce the dimension of diversity, you know, like the tardigrade microbiome, really great. You get those specific associations and bacteria. You know, we're doing a lot of size selection filtration and, and different methods in my labs to create sort of smaller cohorts of the soil community that we are particularly interested in. Yeah, great. Um, I'm really happy for this next question um, because I know that your proposal at, at was really, really great about all these potential opportunities. Here's the question. Um, what are some of the science questions you hope to address once the data set is together? It seems like you must have chosen the gradients in forested biomes for a reason. And I know you have a ton of ideas, Jeff, with your- Yeah, so I, I definitely, I'm a little bit of a technologist, but some of it is also, I just love the biodiversity of what's there. And I could just explore that biodiversity aspect the rest of my life without thinking about the ecological questions, but those are important. So um, one of the, so I didn't get into that because that gets sort of down in another path in where we're going. So some of our initial work was to establish these so that researchers at their own site doing metagenomic data could ask their own specific science questions. So intentionally, you know, didn't go down into areas of other people's research. Um, we do have broader questions that we're interested in the cross-site synthesis perspective. And those deal with um, sort of temperature by soil moisture interaction. So soil moisture plays a big role in microbial community, microbial community respiration, other biogeochemical cycles. And those temperature by soil interactions are a big part of that and why we put together the, the NEON um, proposal. And there's uh, part of the work is real, part of the working group is really interested in land use related questions as, as well. So there's a lot that can be done with it. There are um, specific science questions as part of this. But right now at this phase, we're more focused on the uh, sort of technical aspects of putting things together. Yeah, and perhaps the <laughs> attendees have, have you know, that their minds are churning now of great ideas that could be done with this data set once put together. And so. Right, and that's that's a big part of what we, wel we welcome. So we have researchers on the team that are sort of more into sort of the bioinformatics genomics part. I'd say a large, well over half of our working group is um, sort of a microbial ecologist that want to work with and ask their specific questions and don't care as much about these details. Great. Well, thanks a, a lot, Jeff. Last last chance, folks. Type your questions quickly. Otherwise, we'll we'll let um, Jeff and you all get back to your day. Um, I would just like to thank everybody for attending and huge round of applause and big thanks, Jeff, for presenting today. Um, really excited about, about the group. Um, I think that the, both the, you know, it's this, this uh, the results of your project are going to live on and foment a ton of cool science into the future. So um, really, really interesting. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> motivation. We get a lot of work to do. Yeah, that's OK. <laughs> it's fun. That's it's fun. Yeah. The more we've gotten into it, the more fun it's gotten. Yeah, so that's, that's awesome. So thanks, everybody. And please note that we do have um, the third Wednesday of every month. Be here on this webinar for more synthesis um, discussions. And that's actually 
I think taking a break in around Christmas, but there's a few sessions right on into the winter as well. And you can see the recording of this um, seminar and the prior ones on the, the network office YouTube channel. Um, so just navigate to the to the network office website and you can go into synthesis and you can find everything that you need there, including how to register for the upcoming webinars. So, so on that note, okay, great. Thank you very okay. much. And everybody have a great day. I look forward to seeing you both in hopefully like a couple months. Seeing you in yeah. person, Jeff. Okay. Bye -bye. Take care.